member of the family working outside the organization and other is comparable business or competitors also. The second point is when uh, they I mean, later on they join the organization and you have a uh, non-family member in the same organization being for such long and they've been contributing to the development of the organization. So it's been difficult to, con to allocate a post to the family member when you have a more loyal st staff who is non-family member in the same organization. So this is the risk of having the family member working outside the family uh, companies. So what is your conclusion or advice on this point? Well, uh, my advice is that um, in all the companies I've ever seen in the world, I've never seen one with too many good leaders and too many good managers. So I really don't see that that is a big issue. Okay? I mean, I just don't. We don't have enough good leaders at Enciad. We didn't have enough good leaders in my company. Uh, it just isn't an issue. I mean, I think you always need more talented people. Um, going outside the family business gives you a wider perspective. And, and here's what happens. In the family business, everybody knows that business. Say you've got 1,000 employees in your family business. All 1,000 of them know that business inside and out, what we call content knowledge. If it's a bank, they know everything about banking. If a son or a daughter goes outside and works for someone else, perhaps even in another industry, they come with some process knowledge. They learn new ways of doing things. And when they come back into the business, they have credibility, but they also have some new ideas to make the business stronger. So, I mean, the research shows that almost everyone that works outside the family business finds it that they're more successful coming back in with the experience. The other thing is I think it makes a challenge for the family to make sure that there is a meaningful career opportunity for a young person to come back to. One of my students right now is going to go back into his family business, and he's got an MBA from NCIAD, and no one else in his family business does, and no one else has his level of talent. And so the family is going to have to make a commitment to win him that he will probably be the next CEO of the business if he performs. So in some ways, it really makes it a better market opportunity for everyone. Um, I don't give prescriptions. I will say that your family has to decide if your family thinks it's the wrong thing to do for you to get the outside experience, then maybe that's the right way to approach it. My experience with the students I deal with is that they always feel that it gives them more confidence and a chance to, to get a better view of the world. But there isn't a, ever, anyone who gives you advice and tells you how to do it in a family business doesn't know much about family business. <laughs> Every family has to develop their own plan, strategy based on their values and their goals. And we face the same issues no matter where we are in the world, but our solutions have to reflect where we are in the world and where our business is. Last question. Last question. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Okay, works for us. I've got, uh, I've got a question to ask about, um, two questions actually. One is uh, about the possibility of you coming to Bahrain to give a workshop over three days, which my father was requesting. Um, you know, something that we could, uh, as uh, you know, the next generation of family businesses, uh, as the sons and daughters, we could attend and pay for. Uh, and for you to give us a proper training, proper, uh, you know, succession planning, all of these sorts of things. Uh, the I'm second, sorry. you have to go through the uh, association, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <we can> <laughs> yeah. My second, my second <laughs> question is something that has to do a little bit with uh, the different diagrams that you showed us initially. Uh, uh, with our uh, Fakhro family business, we have. Uh, a different type of structure to anything that you mentioned. And I think in a way it helps to prevent conflicts and things of that nature. We have a, a diversified group of uh, different companies in different segments. Uh, each company has its own general manager. And that general manager reports to one of the family members, uh, either my, myself or my father or uh, my uncle Yusuf. Or, uh, and we meet on a regular basis, once a week. Uh, just to talk about more important uh, or general uh, uh, issues. But there's no set uh, 
head of the family business from the family. So there's no situation where, you know, family members are fighting to be CEOs and that sort of thing. There's no politics. What's your feeling on that structure? And is it something that has worked with other family businesses in the past? Worked with a lot of family businesses where the family really doesn't get involved in the operations, but serves as what I would call executive directors. And they'll have a portfolio. They may have two or three companies or one company, depending on the company. It reports, you know, to the family member. Um, my question for you would be, who's in charge of that group of directors? The oldest brother. So you do have a CEO. Exactly. Sure. <laughs> you know, that's just to kind of get some excitement. Yeah, yeah we, we can talk later about, about that also. Um, just a point on education. We're wrapping up right now, but um, there are a lot of good programs you can go to. Um, that's part of why you have your association here, and so perhaps you should talk about organizing a conference or a workshop here, um, because we can do that, and there's a lot of people around the world that can help. I mean, can come in as speakers, including me. Excellent. Based on that, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Sorry it took so long. But, uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Yeah. See you again. It's a little bit, but that's also kind of a Bedouin tradition, too. I mean, there's loose relationships. But we will talk a little bit about holding companies, because the holding company is a powerful tool, but the vision for the family, if you want to use it as a tool to hold the family together and to hold the businesses together, it has to be there. When I wrap up with Cargill, they're 150 years old, unbelievable family business, and the part that makes it so much fun, you know what the best part of Cargill is? It's owned by two families that don't get along. Okay, and this is not a secret. For 100 years, those two families have been feuding because the Cargills only own a third of the company. Their in-laws somehow managed to end up with two-thirds of the company. And so this family business is owned by two families that have never gotten along very well, and yet because they do some very important ideas that I want to share with you, they've managed to sustain their growth and keep a shared vision for the whole group. But you're exactly right. Values and vision are the fundamentals of any family business anywhere in the world. If we don't agree on what our values are and what our family is going to contribute and what our business is going to look like, then we should split it all up and sell it. Okay? Walk away.
because it's going to be just a conflict all the time. I was lecturing in Singapore a few years ago. It was on at 8 o'clock at night. And a young woman came, and she was a reporter, and she came up and she said, Professor, she said, this is my first job as a reporter. I figured that must be because who do they send out at 8 o'clock at night to a university but a rookie, right? <laughs> it's not exactly a big news story. I mean, you know. So she said, would it be all right if I write some notes about your interview and write a little article? And I thought, well, that would be wonderful. It's her first article. Well, so the next day in the newspaper, the headline comes out, Professor says not everyone should own a pet or a family business. My colleagues at the university said, you're a real world-class thinker, aren't you? Pets are family businesses. And I said, well, but I really meant it. Because a family business requires a lot of care. It requires commitment, both financially and emotionally. It, it requires sacrifice. It requires compromise. It requires thinking about what values we all believe in and then building something, something on that. That's the difference between us and a publicly traded company with a million shareholders who are only owning the stock for as long as the price goes up. And at the end of 90 days, if it hasn't gone up, they sell. At the end of 90 days, you do not sell your grandfather's name. Okay? At the end of two or three years, maybe, or 10 years. But if you and your five cousins hate each other and every day it is a fight, I promise you the business will not grow too successfully. Or if it does grow, it won't grow to the size it could. I had a guest lecturer in my class at NCIAD last week. His family invented one of the most important companies in the world. And his father created this company with the resources from his grandfather, and it's an Indian family, very entrepreneurial. And the father and his oldest son got into a dispute, and grandpa sided with the oldest son. And they fought in court for six years in Singapore. And nobody won. And do you know one of the consequences of their big fight? They owned two pieces of property in Singapore. One was on the corner, it's now called the Wheelock Place, and the other one was on the other corner, it's now the Marriott Hotel. And those two properties are worth a billion dollars a piece, minimum. And the family lost both of them in this big fight in the 80s. They had to give both up. And so while the family's still well off, they don't have their family business anymore. Another company acquired it. The oldest son has not spoken to his father since then, which to me is the real loss. Because I can get another business, but I can't get another family. But the economic loss of losing these two pieces of properties was huge. And that's the consequence of not working together. Okay, That's the struggle. Because I promise you the business will not do as well when you're fighting as when you're working together. So, talk about succession in the next generation. Harry Levinson at Harvard said, a special problem of any chief executive is that whatever he or she changes something that his predecessor established or suggested, the very fact of making a change becomes an indictment of the predecessor. This is one of the issues in family businesses. We come in, we take over, but can we change anything? And this is where, I'm going to talk a little about social support, but where the next generation needs their parents' and grandparents' support because they're going to be running a different business than you ran. I was in business myself for a long time. I was the CEO of my own company. When I look back at some of the decisions we made and some of the things we did 20 years ago, it seems so naive. We would be driven out of business if we made those same decisions because competition has changed, markets have changed, customer demands have changed, products have changed. You know, IBM almost lost their whole company because of their business model and not willing to change. IBM, when they came out with the PC, do you know how long it was supposed to last in the product line? How many years? The portable computer, the desktop computer? Four years. You know what Dell did when they came out? They said our product will last seven days. Now, when prices are falling on components, and you've got four years of thinking into it, and the other guy's got seven days, who's going to win? And who doesn't sell PCs anymore? They ship them to China. And so that's part of what we have to think about. The next generation is going to have to make tough decisions and do things in a different way. Another one, and this gets directly back to what Mr. Canoe talked about, and we did not compare notes on this. But this is Peter Drucker about how to save the family business from the Wall Street Journal. And he said, family members working the business must be at least as able and hardworking as an unrelated employee. 
This is another challenge we face because as our business grows, we may not have enough qualified family members to fill the key jobs. And so we have to bring in outsiders for, for a lot of positions. This is one of the things that Cargill has done so well. There has not been a Cargill or Macmillan at the top of that company for the last 20 years. And earlier on, they had a non-family CEO, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. But it's much cheaper to pay a lazy nephew not to come to work than to keep him on the payroll. Because he damages the whole company. <laughs> now, you made that comment when we were having coffee, and I knew I had this slide <laughs> saved up. And on some way, Peter Drucker said that, kind of the father of modern management. But it is. And so one of the things we have to start to think about is how do we keep quality in our family? And I'm going to show you some slides about that right now. Because our family members have to be committed and they have to be capable, the two C's. Because our non-family employees expect that of us. We have to set the example. And it's a challenge. Now, what do we need for management skills in the 21st century? We need entrepreneurial skills. Every family business around the world was started by an entrepreneur. The only exception, and even then the entrepreneur snuck in, is that there were a few businesses started in the communist countries. The government ran them for a long time, lost a lot of money, and then an entrepreneur took over. So that's the exception. But generally speaking, entrepreneurs create new businesses. And that's where all the job creation, that's where the economic development, that's where the taxes come from. That skill has to stay forever because it's a foundation. But then we need to think about executive skills. How do we manage complex organizations? The example in the back, a holding company with 8 or 10 or 11 operating companies. Very big challenge. That's organization. That is what we teach at NCIAT. Now, we're trying to teach the entrepreneurship, too. Strategy skills. How do we fit into developing business strategies and sound governance, sound decision making, to keep the business going? And then the last one. And that is leadership. How do we develop a firm that's empowering? How do we develop a firm like Apple? How many patents has Apple created in the last 25 years? Nope, wrong. How many patents do you think Apple has in the last 25 years? Well, how old's the patent on the Macintosh? 25 years old. Now, how can you be a technology company and your most important patent is 25 years? Because they know how to empower people. They know how to do things differently. They know how to connect with customers in a different way. They didn't invent the iPod. MP3 players have been everywhere. They invented how you use and sell and market the iPod. They invented how it looks. They invented how it touches. They invented how it tastes. That's Apple. Now, their two patents, by the way, are freestanding staircases made out of glass. Steve and his team developed that so that if you go to any of the stores, you'll see these staircases up and around. They have the patent on it because he was told you couldn't do it. And the clear plastic case for the Macintosh is a separate patent because you couldn't make plastic without bubbles in it, and they developed a way to do it. But the Macintosh operating system is exactly the same one that I sold 25 years ago when my company became an Apple dealer. Hasn't changed a bit. Leopard is a nice improvement, but it's only improvement by prettier colors and more folders hanging in different places. That's what we need to think about. How do we empower people to position our company in a different way? I've put some of the slides here, and I've talked about it. I want to save time so I can talk more about Cargill. But I also want to give you some specific examples of what we need to do with the next generation. So here's the critical factors for developing next generation talent based on our research. We say there's five factors. One, consider the individual needs. Not everyone should be in the family business. And not everyone should be in the same role. Some family members may have the talent and the drive and the desire to be a top leader. Others may be a great employee. Others may be a great manager. Think about how your family fits together and how the individuals are. Life and work experience. How do we get our kids and the next generation the kind of experience that will make them capable for the 21st century? I'm going to show you these things in a moment. 